that this gathering is unto you and unto no one else. And so, Father, we thank you for this opportunity even to share your word one with another. We ask for the presence of your spirit that our hearts will be opened unto you. We will receive your word with meekness that we would grow by it and bear much fruit. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Hallelujah. It's another Sunday, and um, I believe that the Lord is here with us. I was talking to a friend yesterday about God being always here. And um, I want to draw our minds to certain important things this morning. I read a story about two people who went fishing. Two people who went fishing in a boat. And um, they so enjoyed the fact that they were catching a lot of fish. So they got so engrossed in their fishing. As they went on catching more and more fish, they heard a sound that drew their minds to something else. They heard a sound of a rushing water. So quickly they thought that, hey, we might have been near the dam. And when they looked, they were just a few inches to where the high water was flowing out of the dam. I'm not sure if you've seen a dam before. If you go up on excursion and you've seen a dam, you would find out that if you go up on where the sluice valves are, you would see that down there where the water flows out, it flows with such, such very strong current. And when they realized that they were there, they decided to row away from there, but it was too late. And um, in a few minutes, their boat capsized. The fish, the people, the boat itself went underground. So they called for people to come and, you know, dive in and look for these two men who had gone fishing. They searched for them and found one at the bottom of the water and was dead. And after many times of trying, they didn't get the other one. Until the third day, they found him and fishes had eaten most part of his body. If you look at that story, you begin to ask yourself, what went wrong? They only went fishing. But there was one thing that happened that they didn't take notice of. They drifted gradually along the current until they got so close to danger that their expertise in handling the boat Will not help them at that time. Hebrews chapter 2. Shall we turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2? We'll read from verse 1 to 3. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And after it was at the first spoken through the Lord, 
It was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Hallelujah. This morning, we want to ask ourselves a very simple question. Are you drifting? Or you are not? Are you drifting? I've been preparing for like a week to talk on something else. Until this morning when I was in prayer, the Lord drew my mind to this. And so we're all going to look at it to see what the Lord had to say. The story I told us, I read it from the guidepost. And um, when you read the guidepost, you'd find very interesting stories many times. And it is not a make-believe story. It is a true thing that happened. Are you drifting? There are a few things I want us to look at regarding drifting. It is easy to drift. The first thing that I want us to note about drifting is that when you are drifting, it doesn't require any effort at all to drift. Drifting does not require any effort at all to drift. You only drift with the current, the undercurrent. Drifting is an unconscious process. That's what I've concluded. It's an unconscious process. You don't have to make a conscious effort or tell the boat that drift for the boat to drift. It is an unconscious process for drifting to take place. It just happens like that. It doesn't require any effort by you. You don't have to put in an effort for, it to, for the boat to drift. And interestingly, it is the same when it comes to spiritual matters as well. For you to drift from the truth, or for you to drift from the vision God has given you, or for you to drift from a target that God has given into your hand, it comes just unconsciously. You don't have to determine and say, me, I'm going to move away from this. I don't believe in it anymore. But in a few days and few weeks and a few years, those who know you, when they look at it, they can tell that you have drifted. And let's remember the scripture we read, because if we miss it, we miss everything. It says that for that reason, the fact that Jesus Christ was lifted up above all else, and God had crowned him as king, and the fact that he was lifted above the angels, that the angels are not in comparison with him in power or anything or in glory, because of that and the fact that he came for that purpose to die and redeem us unto himself and brought us his message he says we should make every effort to pay attention lest we drift lest we drift and this morning we want to ask ourselves sincerely and honestly if you as an individual you are drifting Now, I also notice that we don't dream, drift, you know, upstream. It's always downstream. You don't drift upstream. You don't drift against the current. It never happens. I've been to sea a number of times, not as a fisherman, but by virtue of my work. I've been to sea a number of times, and I've seen that when a boat is there and it's drifting, it doesn't drift against the current. It always drifts along it. It drifts downstream, never upstream. And in spiritual matters, when you are drifting, to be honest with you, you never drift towards God. You always drift further and further and further away from God. You never drift. Unconsciously, never drift towards God. You always find yourself far removed from God. Now we find out that if it is about drifting against the current or you want to go up against the current, what you do is that you have to keep on paddling or you have to, you know, drop your oars and, and, and be 
controlling the boat towards it or you have to sail that's the only way that you end up going out and the same thing goes in the realms of the spirit you have to remain faithful towards god and faithfulness is like paddling day by day towards the lord day by day as the challenges come you face it every day you take it in your stride you rise and you fall a little you stumble you keep going you keep at it and you persevere and you find out that you begin to move up on string towards the lord that's what i also noticed now the other thing also about drifting that we ought to know that it's as you drift the speed begin to increase drifting starts just gradual with a little push of the wind but as you begin to drift down the speed of drifting begin to increase and does it not happen many times that you would find yourself as a christian and you would tell yourself that i am determined not to do a b c d it just starts with a little drift just a little you know i read a story and listened to a tape by one man of god called derek prince and he has this story he always tells and it's imprinted in my heart and i and i say it very often he said that when he was once in kenya he came across something interesting about a juju man somebody who believes in african medicine and um, he had this juju that he does um, he could come around it's like a magician he could come around and then he would you know do some things say some things and the next moment there's a flood around the place but he doesn't have anything to say for the flood to go away <laughs> and so if he comes to your town and does those things and call a flood you can be sure the water will be there until god have mercy on you and let the sun shine and dry it off and his reason why he always said that was that if you don't have the antidote to bring drought don't start a flood and it's true if you know that your boat will drift have a strong anchor have a strong anchor and we'll soon look at the anchor now when you are drifting also drifting always i have found out many times it poses danger to other people on the water there was a time we you know vra water river authority has a boat that they use on the lake they call it onipenua and uh, it's it's like a hospital ship we went up north the volta to do some work and uh, they have these small um dinghies that uses an outboard motor and the coxswain had to go and do something somewhere so he used the dinghy and went and he was doing the thing and was oblivious completely to himself and volta lake transport has pontoons that run on the on the water and this pontoon is so slow and everybody knows that that the pontoon is slow and so he saw the pontoon far away and told himself that oh this thing by the time he gets here i would have finished and i would have left here he did not know that his dinghy was drifting the next thing he heard was the pontoon had pressed his horn when he looked up he was looking at the pontoon It is good the lord saved him he dived into the water we couldn't pick the outboard motor we couldn't pick the dinghy but he dived deep into the water and by the time the pontoon passed he came up we thought he also had gone but we couldn't pick the pontoon we couldn't pick the dinghy we couldn't pick the outboard motor so when you are drifting you're drifting can cause danger unto other people and it is always true in even in christian dom when a christian is drifting 
he begins to become a danger to other people. Did you hear what he said the other day? Have you heard this one? Did you know they said so and so? And then the other person begins to also pay attention and listen. Because you are drifting, you are becoming dangerous to other people. You are saying things to them, stirring them onto other things, and making them say things they otherwise would not have said. In a few days and weeks and months, otherwise very strong and committed person onto a focus, now has lost focus and vision because you had started drifting. Drifting most often ends up in shipwreck. Drifting. You either would find yourself now having to push this boat from a sand you know, dune or something that you had, you had hit maybe a sand bed or something and you have to now find a way to push this boat alone up into the water. Or you would find out like my friend lost a dinghy and the outboard motor. You would find out that you would end up in shipwreck. And what did Paul say unto Timothy? He says that when people neglected faith and clear conscience, they made shipwreck of their faith. That's why he told Timothy in 1 Timothy. They made shipwreck of their faith. And in drifting, most often, you find out that you would make a shipwreck of your faith. So why do you have to go to the extent of shipwrecking your faith? If you can avoid drifting. If you can avoid drifting. Now what are the signs that we come across when we talk about drifting? in the realm of, of, of being a Christian. First thing that you'd find out when you are drifting, and we want each one of us to be honest and sincere with ourselves this morning, you'd find out that it, is very, it becomes very easy for you to lack desire for studying of the word of God and for personal time of prayer with God. If you find that, you must admit that you are drifting. And if you don't do something about it, you would shipwreck your faith. When you find out that it is becoming more and more difficult for you to enjoy study of the world. When you find out that it is becoming difficult for you to have a personal time of prayer. Why you yourself, you get up on your own, you just go before the Lord and you begin to worship the Lord. You begin to pray and pray and pray until you have felt that you have prayed. You find out that that is becoming difficult. The only time you pray is if you are in the midst of people. If you are in the midst of people, you can pray for an hour or two hours. But if you are on your own, you find out that the desire to pray is gone. And the effort to pray becomes the most difficult effort to make on your own. You are drifting. You are drifting. You are drifting. And that is one thing you must watch. Those are one of the signs that you should look out for. If you look into your life this morning and ask yourself that, how happy am I about putting the Bible in front of me and shutting everybody away and reading the Bible for myself and finding it out? Is it that I only read the Bible if I'm in church? Or I only read the Bible if something came up and I need to find out? Or somebody says something and I want to make a reference? That is how I stray and read other things. If that is how your Bible reading has become, my brother and my sister, you are drifting. And drifting is dangerous. You are drifting. You also find out that one sign, another sign that you'd find is that when there is diminishing interest in the things of God or in coming to the house of God. Now you might say that because Mr. So-and-so or Pastor So-and-so or Sister So-and-so did this. Look, if I don't go, there's nothing wrong. I'll have my own time of prayer. I'll have my own time of fellowship. I'll do my own things. 
or that so and so and so is important. So you find out that for that reason, you won't be in the house of the Lord. You may call it any name you want to, but you are drifting. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And, and if you, if you, I'm sure you, you've heard that song before. I was glad, I was glad when they said unto me, we are going to the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gate. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I don't know if you are glad when they say unto you, let us go to the house of the Lord. I don't know how glad you are. Because I have found myself at that place before where I wasn't glad to go to the house of the Lord because the way things are done, I don't agree with it. The way this is done, I don't seem to like it very much. Why can't they see that this thing is wrong? Why can't they do it this way or that way? And for that reason... I was drifting. I was drifting. Maybe you are like me. And you might have found yourself at that place where you begin to give yourself reason that if I go and pray alone, I seem to pray better. If I come to the gathering of the people, in fact, they discourage me so much that I can't pray. I've been there before. But there's a simple name for it. You are drifting. You are drifting. Let your prayer be towards building that thing that you, you, know, you begin to detest so much that you prefer not to be there. What happened in church? Oh, it's good I was not there. Who preached? Oh, ah, you see. That's it. You know, look, I had a nice time. The Holy Ghost visited. It wasn't the Holy Ghost who visited you. It was not. It was not. Because when you read through the scriptures, you begin to find out that there is no basis for that. God intended for us to worship together. He intended that. So you might have your own reason. One way or another. You might have them. One way or another. But if your joy in worshipping with the people of God is taken away. My brother and my sister. You are drifting. Now, I would like to say that fellowship or coming to church and worshiping is not just about we've come. Let's say hello to one another and we say that and that's where it ends. That's not it. But fellowship, as the Bible records it, intends to build one another up. It was meant to build. So if you come to church and you are not being built up, go before God and begin to pray that Lord, what you intended for the church to be, let it be so that I will be built and my brother will be built, my sister will be built, and we will be built. You know, yesterday in the morning, a certain brother quoted this scripture I'm about to quote. But wrongly, though, the songs of Ecclesiastes, he talks about chapter 4. He talks about if you are alone and there is cold, how can you ever get warm? And he went on and talked about two is better than one. And he says that if you are alone and a pressure comes at you, how can you stand it? And he goes on and talks about if one can be able to stand against the other person, two will be able to overcome the person. You know, what God intended the church to be is for you and me 
together to be victorious. That which you confront in prayer, and you take so much to confront, and sometimes I have talked to people who say that, look, my life has become like a warfare. Virtually every day I have to be worried. You know why it's so? Because you're doing it alone. Get together with one, two, three people. And you find out that in a short while, victory will be yours. But there is this thing that the devil wants you to go through that and to drift away. So he will tell you that, listen, these people, even if you share with them, they won't bear you up. Look, what is it they can pray that you don't know? Which scripture would they use that you don't know already? Is it not the Bible they would use? Look, take the Bible, get a scripture, pray, you can make it. And then you will find out that you are beginning to drift. You are beginning to drift. And you are your own, you know, pastor. You are your own usher. You are everything, bodied in one. Oh, I don't need them. What do I need them for? What is it they will say? I mean, that thing he's saying, that scripture, I know it. I mean, the other day I look at it. There's this part he hasn't even looked at. There's this part about it. You know, and, 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 and you go in that cycle. But what happens is that what that does to you is that it makes you drift away from what God intends you to be. And it makes you drift away from what you could have contributed to somebody to be built up. Are you drifting? Are you drifting? And I want you to be honest and sincere with yourself this morning. It is also important for us to note that if your best friends are non-Christians, your best friends, the people who are your buddy, 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 the people who, whose counsel and advice you take, the people who you consult for a decision are non-Christians, your inclination is in the wrong direction. Your inclination is in the wrong direction. Oh, these Christians, they gossip too much. It's true. I'm not saying Christians don't gossip. It's something that me, he hurts me, he breaks my heart. You tell something to somebody, the next time around, it is, I mean, as if you have said it on the radio. You know? And you hear somebody saying some part of it. And sometimes, unfortunately so, you hear somebody prophesying it. Oh, doesn't it happen? I like to face realities. That's the way... You can confront the issue and solve it. Somebody tells you something. Then you tell the other person. The next time around, you hear a prophecy. And you can tell that, ah, is it not me they are talking about? Which God cried that now when I talk to people, then his spirit now come upon people and they are prophesying my thing like that. Doesn't it happen? And sometimes you tell something to a pastor. The next time he is using you as an example Clearly in the poppy, you can tell that ah, this man, this thing was supposed to be between the two of us. Now you are washing me out in the open. And for that reason, the devil tell you that stay away from them. Keep to yourself. The unbelievers won't do that. You know what he's doing to you? Making you drift. So that bit by bit, he would make you shipwreck your faith. There's a way to confront that. Go before the Lord and begin to pray about the matter than to take that decision to drift. You may think that, oh me, I won't tell this pastor anything ever again. That's a decision you've taken. You did not decide I would drift. But you would find out that that decision alone could make you begin to drift. Because the man used your example and says, it is something, something, something. He said that this man is, I mean, not trustworthy. How can he lie like that? I told him that. Why is he saying the Spirit of God who told him? And for that reason, you have shut your ears. Even when the Spirit of the Lord is speaking, it is a lie as far as you are concerned. That can be of God because you have had one example. And that begins to make you little by little drift away. But keep in mind that when you drift, you will begin to pose danger to others and you may shipwreck your faith. 
one other sign for drifting that you would find out that your desire for sharing the gospel with others begin to dwindle down like that. You find out that you are in the midst of unbelievers and people who do not know God. But you just cannot tell them and stand out and show them that this thing is wrong. This is the way of the truth. You just can't do that. You find yourself gradually moving away your desire to proclaim the gospel begin to diminish now if you ask yourself when was the last time i actually spoke to somebody about god and your answer is like two years ago or a year ago my brother and my sister you are drifting you are drifting you know when piram came to ghana those who did it when they found out what it was, they told their friends. They told their friends. Now, if your God is that valuable to you, and what you have found, you think that is the way to make others saved, wouldn't you share it? Even if it is a command of the Lord, wouldn't you just obey the command of the Lord? Some of us, many people do not even know us as Christians at all. Many people don't know you as a Christian. You are drifting. And one other thing that you must see when it begins to show up in your life, you must know I'm drifting, is that if your examples are always of the past, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago when I was in school, we used to gather and pray and fire actually comes down. Has God, you know, ceased to exist? That your examples are always 15 years ago examples? That you, the God of yesterday, today, and forever has stopped being that God, and He's only for you, the God of yesterday. If that begins to show in your life that most of the examples you are giving to people have to do with your experiences with God in the past, you are drifting. You don't have any real experience with God today to give, you are drifting. You can't talk about during the week, I shared the gospel with this person, and so and so happened. I pray with him. It is always 15 years ago. I remember one time I was on a trotro, and then there was this person, and I felt inside of me, and I spoke the word to the person. The person started you no know, manifesting. I laid hands on him and prayed for him. There and there in the trotro, he had deliverance. 15 years ago. You are drifting. Very soon you will hear a sound of rushing waters near the dam. You hear a sound of rushing waters near the dam. And it will be too late for you to save your soul. It will be too late. It is also very easy to find out if you are drifting if you begin to like the things you didn't like before. If you are beginning to like the things you didn't like before, if you find out now that now, you know, I don't know what is the soap opera on TV now, but if before you didn't like it, but now suddenly you like it, or before, if they even show Miss Ghana on TV, you put off your TV, but now you begin to ask, who won? And, and what, who, who, how was it like? And you begin to ask those things. My brother and my sister, you are drifting. You are drifting. I know people who would spend an hour to pray in the night on Saturday. But maybe now it becomes a thing of the past. If you talk about it, you know those days when I was, Chale, man has grown cold. Oh, we'll get there, we'll get there. But you see, what you should say is that man has drifted away from God. You have drifted. You have drifted. And, and if you drift, you know, it just, it's a gradual thing. You tell yourself, oh, it is only today. Oh, today I really haven't prayed. Oh, okay, tomorrow. And then tomorrow you don't pray. Okay, the next day I will. Then the next day you don't. Hey, it's three days old. This thing is becoming serious. Then it becomes four days. Five, six, seven. One week. Hey, I haven't prayed for one week. Meanwhile, you have seen, you no, know, you probably have in your room, 
you know, one week without prayer makes, you know, a, a man weak or whatever they, that they write. You are probably have even that banner hanging in your room, you know, and you know it. Then you tell yourself, okay, that's for this coming week. I'm going to do this. Then the week starts. Hey, Monday has passed. You see, you are drifting. You are drifting. And if you drift that way, you will tell yourself, you see, that's what always happens. When you are drifting, you will still tell yourself, I'm safe. Because many times you tell yourself that, oh, I mean, I'm not doing this or that or this or that. I'm still faithful to my wife. And I'm still, you know, I pay my tithe. I go to church faithfully on Sunday and all that. So everything is okay. But you see, it is a gradual thing. You may never, you know, be unfaithful to your wife. You may never stop paying your tithe. You may never, you know, quit coming to church. You may never decide to go to the fetish. You may never decide to sacrifice your children or introduce them to wrong things. But your heart has drifted away from the Lord. And he is the one who knows the intent of the heart of man. One day you will hear that word and it will come like a strong rushing sound of water near the dam. And he will tell you that I did not know you it just starts little you don't need effort for you to continue drifting you move along the current when you find yourself beginning to love pleasure more than God my brother and my sister you are drifting I don't want to be reading the scriptures I just want to Go on and, and, and let's, let's look at this matter and, and come to the things that God has actually laid on my heart this morning. When you begin to love pleasure more than God, you are drifting. You are drifting. Because the Lord himself has said through Paul that in the latter times, men shall become lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You are drifting. See, the drifting comes in a way such that when you are drifting, you think that I'm still okay. But that is how drifting is. You make you think that you are still safe. It is until you draw near the dam that you would wake up. And then you would find out that it's too late. But God doesn't intend you and me to draw near the dam. Hallelujah. What is the remedy for drifting? What is the remedy? The first thing that is required for you, if you have agreed that you are drifting, if you've looked at your life and you know that, look, honestly, I am not what I was two years back, three years back. Gone were those days that alone I'll get up, pick my Bible. And I'll go on evangelism. Gone were those days that I would get up on my own, you know, and go to the roadside and share tracts with people. Gone were those days that I would stand, you know, when somebody says something wrong about God, I say, please, you can't say that when I'm here. You can't. You just can't do that. Gone were those days when you would bring your children before the Lord and insist on them reading their Bible before they eat. But now it's okay. I mean, don't worry. Don't worry the children. Allow them. You see, allow them. You have changed. You have drifted. If you have done that, you have to first of all acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge it. And you have to come to that place where diligence becomes your watchword. That you get diligent. You must get very diligent. It is required of me and of you for us to be diligent. Just like, you know, you have a boat on the water that is drifting, it is important for you to keep on paddling against the stream, for you not to drift. You have to keep on paddling. It is very easy to stop paddling because you tell yourself that time, I don't have time. Okay, this now I'll do it in the evening. But you know what? You won't do it in the evening. 
You tell yourself, I'll do it tomorrow morning. And then you, the next morning, somebody calls you early in the morning. And by five, you're out of home or you're on your way. Or somebody calls you and talk for like an hour on the phone. And you find out that, oh, the time I wanted to do this, I didn't do it. Okay, I'll do it in the afternoon. Ah, afternoon, I have promised to do so and so. And then you find out that's how it happens. And let's be human. Let's be real. These are the things that happen. The only way you can avoid it is to get diligent with God. That you begin to put God first in many things and decide in your heart and go beyond the desire that I am going to keep at this thing. That is the only way. That's the only way. Perseverance. And that is something you need to be able to avoid drifting. You must persevere. You're doing something and somebody is talking about it. And for that reason, you want to quit. And the next time around, you've drifted. You sat at the back. And you could sit at the back for years. Because I have been there. You can sit at the back and you'll be at the back. You'll be at the back. By the time you realize things that you did not ever think that you would think or do, you find yourself doing them. You know that God had put you in a position where he you know, talked to you one-on-one. On one. He gives you maybe a vision or a word in your heart or he, you know, he uses you to talk to somebody and the person is encouraged and lifted up. You know that God has been taking me to that place and that's where God has been taking me. But for some reason, you decide that, look, let me stay in my corner. And you stay in your corner. You know what happens? The vision ceases. I've seen that before. The prophecy stops. The word of knowledge God gives you, it stops. Because you are drifting. Maybe you've been the type that you could have a dream. And it is as if God has just come down and opened the books to you and explained things. But because of so and so and so, you have decided that, let me stay in my corner. You'll be amazed. For years, you haven't dreamt before. And any dream you had, it's about some party somewhere, or about some cow that chased some goats, and about some dog that couldn't allow this. Those are the dreams you end up having. What God used to do with you, he won't do it with you anymore because you have moved and moved and moved. You've moved. You might have joined the bandwagon of people who are criticizing. And who are saying this, and who are saying that, who are saying this. And one of the things you find out, when you are drifting, you never know it yourself that you are drifting. And when you don't know that you are drifting, you begin to think that it's okay with you, and it's that person who is drifting. Maybe because you have prayed and God had answered Maybe you, you know you you've gone somewhere and God had glorified His name. Oh, but the last yesterday when I, you know, it was great. God really moved, and that begin to make you think you have not drifted. Ask yourself if your relationship is with God the way it has always been. Are you increasing in the knowledge of God? Are you increasing? Is your knowledge of God increasing? Or the way you have known God some years ago, that is just where it has been. You have not grown in knowledge of Jesus Christ. You have not grown in knowledge of Jesus Christ. You have not grown in the grace of God. The grace of God hadn't abounded on you. You haven't grown in it. It's your relationship with God. It's your commitment to him beginning to grow and deepen. Are you beginning to enjoy your relationship with God afresh every day? Or it has become stale? It has become so lukewarm? Or it is as usual what it is always been? That, oh, you wake up in the morning, you read your Bible, and you pray. No freshness, no dew comes upon your, no, upon your fellowship with God. Nothing. No revelation comes. Nothing. And you just think that it is okay. God had heard it and that's it. And your relationship is growing cold every day. And you think it is normal. It is not normal. It's not normal. It's not normal. We have to come to that place where you know that, look, God, you, those, those days that God used to talk to me, you know, before I do something, you know, the Lord would come and he would speak to me and and I just knew that God has spoken. And I just take that action. But now you're on your own because you have drifted. 
you have drifted. And you think you know it all. And once you begin to think you know it all, you're on your own. You're on your own. Let's read Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 5 says that now for this very reason also, applying all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. Verse 6 says that in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness. They render you neither useless nor fruitful in the true knowledge. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10 says that therefore brethren. Be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things. You will never stumble. As long as you practice these things. You will never stumble. Are you stumbling? You may stumble because you stop practicing these things. You may stumble because you stop practicing these things. And we want to ask ourselves sincerely this morning, what is the state of your relationship with God? What is the state of your relationship with God? Watch out for the undercurrent. They are the things that make people drift. And that's one of the things I want us to pay attention to this morning. The undercurrent. They are the things that make people drift. Have you heard this person say so and so? Oh, really? Did you hear this, this, this? You see, and sometimes the reality is this. You will, in your heart of heart, think that you are doing something right. You are genuinely discussing an issue. But you find out that in discussing the issue you think you were genuinely discussing, you are gradually sowing the seed that will make it easy for you to drift. You are gradually sowing that seed that will make you drift. It is important to look out for the undercurrent. Once you know that this thing is there, Avoid it. Watch out. If you know that this person, he likes to talk about this and that and that. Look, avoid the person. That's my philosophy in life. If you, you, you are the type who would be telling me that, oh, have you heard that? This, this, that, and that and this, this, this. If you do that to me once, the second time round, I won't ha you won't have my ears. You won't have my ears. And I would cut you off either... Either you are hurt or you are not hurt, I'll cut you off in a way that you know that I have cut you off. Not that I won't talk to you, not that I wouldn't be committed to you, but I just will not give you my ears for you to tell me those things. If you start, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. Because those are the things that make people drift. They are the things that make people drift. So if you want to avoid drifting, watch the undercurrent. Watch the undercurrent. Somebody comes up and he's genuinely concerned about something that, oh, have you know, noticed that so and so and so and so, yes? The next time around, that discussion begins to deteriorate into something else. One philosophy I believe is good. In the multitude of words, there always is sin. It's always there. There always is sin. So when you have somebody who likes to talk, look, listen with one ear and be hearing the thing and be cross-checking with the scriptures, immediately you hear the things that would make you know this is sin. Walk away from it. Walk away from it. And many times, we say Ketsi. For me, I've always said that if I follow Ketsi every time, I'll end up in hell. So I just don't follow any ketsy. 
if the thing is wrong, it's wrong. I won't say, oh, you see, I will hurt your feelings. So this, 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 and so, you know, okay, then I'm tolerating that. But before I notice it, you've sown a seed of bitterness in me. And you walk away free. And I live with it and begin to battle and begin to have no problem with relating to people. So for me, if that is your lifestyle, you just can't get along with me. I will talk to you, hello, how are you? This one and that one and that one and that one. The next one where I've drifted away, I'm gone. Because I want to safeguard my faith. Let's remember the scripture we read in Hebrews. It says, for that reason, for the fact that Jesus Christ came and he was lifted high up. He came, gave himself to us above angels and all. For that reason, make every effort to ensure that you don't drift from that message that you have heard. If the every effort involves the fact that, look, keep your distance, come to church, worship with people, commit to them, when they start and say, please, I'm not interested. I'm not. You, this person is some way, eh? He thinks he's the only holy person in the house. You know, even the other day, so and so and so. Yeah, I mean, that's it. Let it go on. But that is the way to ensure that you don't drift away. Because the reason is simple. He says that in the days past, when even angels and the prophets had spoken, and God made sure he punished every sin according to what it is, how much more would it be now that his own son had come and brought the message and salvation to you and I, and we neglect it? Are you neglecting your salvation? Are you chasing wealth and neglecting your salvation? Are you chasing fame and neglecting your salvation? And some of us, we chase our family and neglect our salvation. We chase our family. Our family becomes, my, my mother says so and so, my father says so and so, my wife had told me so and so, and my, my husband has said this. And then, you know, instead of going to God in prayer and bringing it and praying through until God makes a way out, then we begin to take a decision and we begin to drift. And then you find yourself drifting because the seed has been sown. And then you are watering it unawares. And you begin to drift. You begin to drift. One day, you would hear that sound. You look up, and you are near the dam. And you don't have any way to turn. And you find out that your boat will capsize. They may not find you after a day or two, because you would have drowned. Don't let it happen to you. And for that reason, it is always important to go against the tide. If you want to remedy drifting, you must go against the tide. You must go against the tide. It is very important. You find people who say, you know, you don't do this like this. You see, and they bring liberalism, modernism, all those things. You know, this is how it is done. I remember a friend was telling me about, you know, we needed to pray about something. And somebody said, we see... You don't have to pray. I said, look, watch that person. That person who says, I'm a Christian, is telling you that we don't have to pray because there are other people of other faith. They watch that person. Avoid that person. Don't take such persons and no advice. A Christian who is telling you that, you see, let's take out the prayer part. You know, we don't have to pray because other people who are this, who don't believe in what we believe may be there. So we don't have to pray. And advising you to do that, please. Avoid that person the next time round. That is a way to make sure that you don't face the wrath of God. You are trying to make sure you don't make a shipwreck of your faith. If you don't do that, you would find out that it becomes difficult for you to stand as a Christian. It will become difficult. And you know, if we drift as individuals, it will be difficult for us as a church to achieve the vision of the Lord. If we drift as individuals, 
it will be very difficult for us as a church to achieve the vision God has given to us. You have begun to drift in your heart. How then does the Lord command his blessing upon a work if you are sent from here to maybe Nigeria for a particular assignment? Maybe in your heart you have allowed bitterness to grow because I am not the one who is in charge of this or I am not the one who is sent to do A, B, C, D. How will God command his blessing upon that thing when you have been given an assignment? Maybe you felt peeved because I was doing this. And all of a sudden, they brought this sister to come and add. Why? Do they think I don't know what they are saying? They want to see that I'm not doing well, so they brought her to say she's coming to help. Look, she should do it. That's it. Then you continue like that and say, oh, me, I only come to church. Let me come to church and worship my God and serve my God. You know, all that. Look, let, them, let her do it. That's her way. Okay, she should take it. Now, how do you think it will be like if you are sent from here? Then they didn't get there. You are sent to a town for an assignment. How will God command his blessing on that assignment? Because you have drifted away from the Lord. Because we want to stay close. Because we want the Lord to command his blessing upon us. Let us endeavor not to drift. Let us endeavor not to drift. If you drift, you're on your own. The Lord cannot be with you. The Lord cannot be with you. Let's read two last scriptures. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Having received him, so walk also in him. Let's come to that level of being childlike, and ask yourself that the way I receive the Lord, is that how I'm walking in him today? You see, we always say that we have seen things. Look, as for us, we've seen these things before. You know, I have seen it before. Maybe I've been in this church and it so and so happened. I've come here and this and this and I went here, this and this. So for me, look, I know these things. I see these signs. And for that reason, you have allowed yourself to be put into a corner that you don't want to release yourself to be used of the Lord. The way you received the Lord, is that how you're walking in Him? Maybe not. Maybe not. But that's what the Bible enjoins you to do. That you would be rooted in him. It is giving an impression of a tree that goes down with its roots solid on the ground. Then it talks about being built up. Talking about a building that is firmly put up. A structure that rises high up. It's putting the two into one. Talking about your faith. That let your faith go down like a tree. Deep into the root. And then let you, your life and your character come up like a building. Rise up, build up. So that the fruit of the Spirit is seen in you. That you begin to grow in Him. That people see you and they can see straight away. No, this person has something in Him. They shake you, you are not shaking because your root is deep. Built on solid ground. That way, you won't drift. That way, you won't drift. Everybody will see that you are immovable. The writer of Hebrews talked about the fact that let us remember those days when we have first come to believe the Lord. In chapter 10, let us come to that point we, re we, we came to believe the Lord. Where we were ready to identify with people who had received the gospel and were preaching it. To the point where we were ready to go through pain and suffering. Maybe that was how your life was like. You were ready to do anything for God. Anything. Anything. I'll do it. 